I've often thought about when I'm watching these uh, TV ministries today, uh, they talk about campuses. You know, they've got this campus here and they've got this campus there. They've got ten campuses, three campuses, whatever the number is. You know, and this morning, you know, as we were worshiping, God was showing to me that Cornerstone has two campuses. You know, we have a campus down in the prison. You know, and we have a place to reach down there. Uh, just as much as we're reaching up here. And, you know, Jesus said, you know, uh, if I was sick, did you come and see me? Or if I was in prison, did you come and visit me? And I just want to tell you that uh, it's just a humbling experience for me to be there. The prison at this present time has now moved into what's called three movements. So the prison has uh, three groups of people that can come. So today we started in the chapel. So I'll be... Uh, I did movement one this morning and this afternoon I'll do movement two and movement three or group two, group three and that's what I'll be doing there. Uh, we have got a five disc player on the channel 64 on the TV and I put movies. So thanks for uh, giving us movies uh, because we need Christian movies and uh, something that will really lift them up because if you've seen the junk, the junk that goes in on the other movie channel you would, you would be just deeply saddened and grieved into your heart. You know, the whole idea is for us to be, uh, to exercise what is the vision of prison ministries in Canada, and that is restorative justice. We're not a penal system, we're restorative justice. And sometimes we work against ourselves with the things we allow to happen down there. So we have those discs, so I put the five movies on on Friday, so they get movies on Friday night and all day Saturday. Today they get five sermons that are going there that they can they can watch all day today they can watch them all day on monday and i'll switch something out on tuesday and so that's an update for you of what's happening there down at the prison so if you'd like to stand with me i'm going to read these first 16 verses i need a big print bible in the future i think <laughs> but let's go with this now so just agree with me in the word of god here it says here that the same, Jesus, same day Jesus went out of the house and he sat beside the sea and a great crowd gathered about him so that he got into a boat and he sat down and the whole crowd stood on the beach and he told them many things in a parable. A sower went out to sow and as he sowed some seeds they fell among the path and the birds of the air devoured them. Other seeds fell on rocky ground where they did not have much soil and immediately they sprung up and since they had no so depth of soil but the sun rose and scorched them and since they had no root they withered away. Other seeds fell among thorns and the thorns grew up and choked them. Other seeds fell on the good soil and produced grain some a hundredfold 60 fold and 30 fold he who has ears let him hear then the disciples came and said to him why do you speak to them in parables and he answered them to you it has been given to know the secrets to know the secrets of the kingdom of God of heaven but to them it has not been given for the one who has more, has more will be given, and the other one who has an abundance, but the one that has not, even that that he has, will be taken away. This is why I speak to them in parables, because seeing they do not see, hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. Indeed, in their case, sorry, indeed, in their case, the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled. And when it says... You have indeed heard and never understood, and you have indeed seen but never perceived. For the people's hearts have grown dull, and their ears, and they can barely hear, and their eyes have closed, lest they should see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand in their hearts, and turn, and I would heal them. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. Praise be to the Lord Jesus Christ. So, uh, 
Pastor John, before the, we moved into Easter time, uh, began and preached uh, on the parable of the sower. And, uh, and as he was preaching, I was reminded of the things that God had shown me in my heart over a, quite a period of time. And how this so much tied in uh, with what God had been showing me. And during that time, I felt that it was important for me to share with Pastor John um, what, the God, what a God revealed to me. And I want to first say that I am not a prophet and I'm not a son of a prophet. Uh, I think I am a preacher. I hope I am. That can you know, bring the word of God to the broken souls of mankind and including my own, uh, that uh, good things will happen because Jesus wants them to come. And so I don't claim to be a prophet, but though I know this has some prophetic tones to it. There's people in this house who probably are and uh, know, know how to be a prophet more than I do. And so my message is slightly different. So I've called this Sowing Seeds for the Kingdom. The purpose is to f cultivate a good heart to receive the pure word. That's the purpose for today. But before we go there, the introduction's a little long because I just want to elaborate and do a little history walk with us. Uh, and, and so we need to understand what was the Christian history of Europe and North America, may I say South Africa as well and other parts of the world that, uh, that the gospel had gone through, gone to and, uh, and how devout people were and those countries around us as well. But it, my focus is here because we live in North America and also that I'm a person, a product of Europe as well. Christians, Christians, I want to say this now, right? Christians were the ones who launched education for children. Sunrise, the spirit behind the Sunrise School, right, was there long before the public system established itself there. And I want you to understand that. Because when there was orphans and street kids and urchins, urchins running around the streets of places like England, churches rose up and decided that they needed to provide education for these and help them to move forward. Now you probably don't know this, but the pioneer spirit where we are here today, most of the Protestant churches that are out here, out west, they were churches that came from the Methodists. And the Methodists is where the roots are the roots of the Pentecostal movement, because we're part of the holiness movement. There's been great debate about how far Wesley went when it came to the Holy Spirit and or did not go. I but there's lots of uh, there's lots of evidence in his ministry that God moved powerfully through that. Well, Wesley, in England, he took those children off the streets, fed them, housed them, and educated them. Those that had better educations, uh, or were more, in, more intellectually intelligent, if you like, he found them places to go. He found them trades. He found them uh, to do all kinds of other professions that they would have never had as a street person. And they did that. And we need to remember that. And we need to redeem that. Here, as the pioneers went forward and they wanted a church, they would look back to a seminary and they would try and hire a pastor. That pastor, by the way, came for life. They paid him in cords of wood, grain. There was no high salary or anything like that. They fed them, they kept them, and, and housed them. But they particularly looked for a young pastor who'd fallen in love with a school teacher. So they get two for one. We're, we're always frugal in the church, you know. We hire a pastor and we, we hope that the, the pastor's wife can sing, you know. Because then we get two for one, you know. And then if we want the technical support, we hope that they've got children that are smart enough to run the system, you know? So we get four for one, and so on and so forth. But you know what I'm saying here. You, that was what the pioneer spirit was in the educational field. Universities sprung up 
It's ironic, if you look at the names of universities in Europe, they're named after biblical characters. You know, Saint whatever, you know? If, if, when you go to Oxford, when you go to Oxford in England, right, they were started again by Christians. When you go there, you think it's one big campus. It's not. The whole of Oxford is a campus. And there's colleges everywhere, but they all belong to the University of, of uh, Oxford, you know, Cambridge. When the Reformation period came up and they started getting a bit more liberal thinking going on in Oxford, some Puritans decided that we need another university to keep it pure. That's Cambridge, right? But the thing I want to try and point out to you is that these things have lost its biblical worldview of thinking. You couldn't teach, you couldn't be in a, you couldn't be in a university as a professor if you could not think through a biblical paradigm when you were educating. That was the measuring stick. That's how they measured it all. Healthcare, hospitals, it's people like Florence Nightingale that seen a fight and a battle in the Crimea and could see the suffering of soldiers that could not get any medical care, rose up and went there and started nursing stations. The floundering start of hospitals, if you like. You know, the, the, the Princess Anne um, nursing, nursing uh, organization of England is, a, is where military nurses uh, go and train. Florence Nightingale, uh, Switzerland, after, uh, during the Hundred World War, there was such a devastating battle in Switzerland where bodies laid all over the ground and nobody was looking after them and the church rose up. Those Reformation people rose up and went in there to help them. And the Red Cross was formed and they just took this, they took this, this, the Swiss flag, the red background white cross, because they claimed to be a Christian name, na uh, nation, and they put a red cross on a white background. The red cross. These things we came. Healthcare was there. If we want to look at social housing, when the poor houses were there and that, it was Christians that said, we've got to make a change here. Orphanages started. You know, George Mueller, if you read about these people, I want to tell you something. We have a deep, deep, rich, active faith that permeates the whole of Western society. Without that, we would not have the Western society that we have today. And so social justice, others rose up, rose up and said an end to slavery, an end to it, and did things. You knew if you've uh, read a book called General Gordon of Khartoum, he was a devout Methodist, a very devout Methodist. He was actually an engineer in the military, served in, in, in uh, the, the Boxer Wars in um, China, and he was often hired by foreign armies. His real rank was colonel in the British Army, but they hired him and made him a general because he was a brilliant m tactician. And he brought his tactics out of how we shouldn't fight a war during the Crimea. And so he's influenced so strongly, never married, because the woman he wanted married was married to his best friend, so he never got married, you know? And, but he dedicated his life. He turned all his salaries over to the Methodist movement to fund the orphanages and to help raise boys up and girls to place themselves in society. You see, we've lost a biblical worldview of how we should live and how we should function. And I want to say to you, I'm not on a crusade here. I'm not here to try and snatch the health care back. But I want to tell you the pattern. The pattern is simply this. People's conscience had seen that there was a need being met. It became politically expedient for the politicians to get on board. And the way they do that, because I've been part of this system when I was working in drug rehab, offer you money. We want to support you. We want to give you funding. Never took the funding. You know why? Because along with the funding comes conditions. And the narrative has to change. 
to meet the political view of the day. And this is how it happened. And then comes along the person and sees, you could actually make good money of this. So let's adopt some of these principles and these methodologies and uh, let's privatize it and make money. But I want to say to us today, the seeds of the truth of these things that we have that makes up the Western society belong to God, they're in the church, and we need to see the seed grow. We need it back. We need seeds of the kingdom being sown again and again and again. The evidence for what I'm saying to you today is because we've seen droughts. We've seen droughts. We've seen famines. We've seen climate interruption. I don't want to call it climate change. Climate interruption. Earthquakes. Plagues and wars. We're coming out of a plague. We're coming out of it. The plague that ended the First World War was the Spanish flu. People won't say that, won't want to admit that. They want to talk it in political terms. But let me just point to wars for one moment here. Be very careful when you see a religious leader align themselves with a political leader. Because that's happening right now. That is happening right now. Hitler aligned himself with religious leaders that, that, were, that thought that the Jews were the curse on the earth. And they crucified Christ. Well, let me tell you, Jews and Gentiles did. They were all part of that political system that crucified our Christ. And when you see that happening, what you could see is like normal, GDP is good, everything is kosher, we're trading, we're all doing this and we're doing that, we're all filling our pockets, our houses are getting better, our lifestyles are great, and then bang, a religious leader aligns himself with a political leader. And a political leader starts speaking scripture. Be careful. Be very careful. Now, I know that there are Christians out there in politics who are doing their best to be a salt and light in the system. And I'm, and I'm grateful for that. I'm not saying that you shouldn't be involved in politics as a Christian. In my opinion, the areas I've mentioned, we should all, all find an avenue to be involved in those areas. If you're called, do it. We've lost the sense of call. The Puritans believed that every man was called. If you were called to be a farmer, you were a farmer. If you were called to be a blacksmith, you were a blacksmith. If you were called to be a lawyer, you were a lawyer. If you were called to be a judge, you were a judge. If you were called to be a pastor, you were a pastor. We were all called to something that is much bigger than us. And it is scary, I'll be honest, pretty scary. Pretty scary thing to give a person like me a pulpit. You know, it's not the thing that I wanted. I ran and tried to stay away from it. But you know, when you know that God has given you a gift to speak, to teach, to show people, to communicate, you cannot go burying it in the sand. Or burying it in the hurt of your life, or burying it in the circumstances of your life. You can't do those things. The Holy Spirit, sorry, the soul of the church has the blood of Jesus Christ crying out to cleanse the soil. We need the soil cleansed. Jesus' blood, it says the blood of Abel cried out for justice. What do you think the blood of Jesus does? Jesus shed his blood for every inch of soil of this earth that he created. There's not a river flowing, there's not a mountain higher, there's not a depth of an ocean that the blood of Jesus Christ did not repurchase to redeem what belongs to him. The Holy Spirit cries out to lead and to teach us the unadulterated word, the seed of God. The Holy Spirit is crying out. I've, you know, it says that the Holy Spirit groans with deep groanings that we don't understand. You know, we, we, we sort of think that about him just praying, but I'm telling you, there's a groan in the land. 
there is a groan in the land that we cannot see resolved unless we hear we hear the heart of God just like the chemical companies have altered the soil that we sow seeds in with chemicals they have modified seeds for the farmers to sow so has the secular idealism altered the soul of this world I put in here Europe and America the soil has been contaminated it's been altered you can produce ten times the amount of grain in an acre but what is the consequences that on our health I could stop for now and probably ask Dr. Leo to come here and tell us right but it's true we've done things man has done things to so-called make more money do things better thinking they're making it better and things have not got better if you don't believe me why do you think right now there's a war going on there's going to be a famine of because those crops won't go in the breadbasket of the whole of Europe is Ukraine and if that's not getting in our attention let this get our attention we had one of the worst droughts in history and we're looking like having another one in the other breadbasket of the world of Canada and the northern part of the US you see we all want to look at human ideas secularism ideas of why things are happening and I'm not trying to be critical of them because they are trying their best to figure it out but do they want to figure it out through a biblical worldview because if we figure it out from a biblical worldview we will actually understand what's going on the church and I'm I, I always like to give the joyful message but this is not so joyful so those that are listening to me online today and those that are here today I pray that as I say these things that the Holy Spirit will massage our hearts not harden them not to cause barriers in our mind but the church has contaminated the soil and it has compromised the seed I hate to say that I'll give you, I'll give you one example that I, that I thought about this would be back when I was pastoring in Saskatoon we had a youth movement we talked about Friday night it was a Friday night youth movement and it was citywide there was a mini youth revival going on and then somebody came along and thought we have to be more relevant to the youth of our day and there's a point when our relevance becomes irrelevant and irreverent I'll tell you what happened they decided in the worship service they needed more space here and and I don't know I don't know if you know what a mosh pit is it's where the youth come and dance jump up and down jump on each other's bodies and pass each other around I started to pray that that would stop unfortunately what I didn't know is that the stage was going to break one night and put an end to it do you think that was a sign do you think God was trying to say something? The remedy is the Word of God. The remedy is the Word of God. So the parable of the sower here, the first 11, I want to go to verse 11 first, right? Because Jesus, now that's not me, this is Jesus saying this. This is what he's saying. The secret of the remedy has been given to us. The secret of the remedy has been given to us. Especially if you have eyes to see and ears to hear. The remedy for all these problems has been given to us. Jesus is a way maker and we're remedy people. He can make a way straight in the wilderness and in the desert of our current time of history. But the secret has been given to us. But how many of us go to the source of the secret? How many of us sit there and start journaling insights on how 
we can change the soil of the church and bring back the unadulterated word. Verse 4 talks about birds as a metaphor. Birds are a metaphor. If you read anything in the negative about a bird, do you know what, it, you know what it's talking about? See, the Jew of the day would have known what he was saying. It's saying demons come and steal the ground. They steal the seed. There's demonic activity going on all the time. And we need to have eyes to see it and ears to hear it. People have been so desensitized through the media for decades on the supernatural and the dark side of the realm. And have, in a sense, become lukewarm in there. They just, oh, that's just movies, that's just this, that's just that. Value's the same. Demons have come along and they're stealing, they're stealing the truth. And I, again, I'm not against entertainment, I'm not against television. You know, there could be some really good lines, good things in there, you know. I mean, I love the line that comes out of, uh, uh, out of Gladiator. Just in that opening scene, they're getting the cavalry together, right? And, and uh, Russell Crowe says to his men, what we do today will determine how we will live in eternity. What a godly line was that, eh? What a godly line was that? I mean, I go, wow. Um, God is crying out, even when they don't know it. Even the high priest said, better for one man to die than a whole nation die. He didn't even know he was prophesying and he's trying to crucify the Messiah. We have to have ears to hear and eyes to see. Verse 5, a heart of stone versus a palatable one. Right? So, our soils are hard. And I don't know about you, before I was a Christian, I was pretty hard. Pretty hard. And my occupation at the time in the military and anti-terrorism and all those kind of things and being on the front end of the shop end of the stick. If it's done anything for me, it's, it's, it's shown me how to pray through this Ukrainian crisis and devastation that's happening there. And you know what? When we watch, say, when we watch these vivid war movies, you know, I'm not talking about the old style with John Wayne. I'm not talking about where you go, ah, doom. You know, where you don't really see much but a bit of, you know, ketchup on, a sh on the sleeve of a shirt or something. I'm not talking about that. But when, they sh when you see this vivid stuff that's in these, in the, in these video games and, it's, and that, I, I mean, I don't watch that stuff. I, I can tell you this story. It was in Bible college. And the, and the movie Platoon was coming on. My best friend in Bible college kept saying to me, I want you to go and see the movie with me. I want you to go and see the movie with me. I said, I don't want to see the movie. No, I need you to come and see. I, needed, I need you to tell me when we watch the movie, was it authentic? I said, no, I won't go. And he said, come on, why not? I said, you don't understand. You'll be watching a movie and I'll be sitting there, I'll be smelling the smell of destruction of a human life and a human body. I will be smelling the gun smoke. I'll be smelling the, the artillery ammunition going off. And so then I will be triggered into my post-traumatic stress disorder and I don't want to go there. We don't need to be numb. And we don't need to be dumb. We need to know that the secrets are within inside of us. So, a palatable heart is a deep and caring heart. That's, that's one thing I, when people say, well, did you really get a new heart? Keep, well, yes. Because I became very, very caring. I was back to my 11-year-old boyhood when God was very important to me in those days. I came back to there and I tell you, it was like a child in his hand. Nightmares and dreams, God was washing out. When I started those nightmares and those dreams, I didn't know what to do with them. And when I would wake up, God would say to me, denounce the violence. I'd get on my knees and I'd start denouncing the violence that I'd been involved in. God was giving me a new heart. I'd have been a horrible pastor if I had not had my ears open 
and my eyes to see. Because if you wanted to argue about which color the carpet was going to be in the sanctuary, I'd have been your worst enemy. Because I'd be like, is this a life and death thing? Are we fighting over this? Is this life and death? Because my world was a different world. And that's why I always try to have a deep respect for the fact that, I, that you have a different world that I may not have. But I need to have a soft heart in order to understand it. And so you have to have a deep and a caring heart. Deep hearts have deep roots in faith. Deep roots in faith. Unquestionably. Our young people need people with deep roots of faith. I'm not irrelevant at my age. I am still relevant. I want to die just like Charles Finney died. Charles Finney was a very old man. I, don't actually, I just want to qualify this for my wife's sake. I don't want to happen today. He preached his month, Sunday morning service. He went home and had his lunch. He sat in his chair, woke, fell asleep and never woke up. But I don't want to die before I see a revival. I do not want to see, die before I see a revival. Young people need deep roots of faith. When I was in my rebellious years, I still went to the Methodist youth group. And my youth pastor was 70 years old. He didn't lead a Bible study. We do a devotional thing. But he wasn't leading me in the Bible studies and teach me things. He was teaching me how play snooker, you know, the English way where you can make the ball go around the balls and do all kinds of things, you know, real sharks type stuff. But he would share his life and his faith with me. He would listen to me and my struggles. We'd shoot balls and he would give me answers. I never forget that. I never forget that. Our young people need people with deep roots of faith. Thorns are what God calls the curse of the ground, the fallen ground. If we allow people to take the ground and curse it again, if we allow that to happen, it doesn't matter how much time we try to sow seeds. It's not going to have an effect on people who have so many thorns, because the curse of the ground in Genesis says, the thorns will rise up, and you have to defeat that by the sweat of your brow. Now, I know we've been delivered from the curse, but the people around us don't. They've got all kinds of thorns coming around and choking them down. I'm not going to get into it, but if you, if you knew what, what I was put through this week, And it was a test, big test. Big test to everybody involved. But you know what? It came out gloriously. But it was hard for me to cast all my cares upon him. Because I had all the answers. But my answers was not being respectful of what God was doing in the person's life. And then we have the ears to hear and eyes to see, to tune ourselves in. Tune ourselves in to those that God puts around us. The true church has a soil to plant redeemed seeds for the kingdom. A true church has that. I was late getting up this morning. I'm usually there before, but I basically, at 6 o'clock, and went to my prayer time, my reading time, my devotional time. And I want to pick this up in Colossians 2 in the first verse here. And I'm just going to read it to you because you don't actually have to preach this one. That's why I like, do you, do you like it when you, you get into the past of the Bible? It's just too plain. It's just too plain and obvious. So remember verse 11, you've been given the secrets. This is what Paul has to say. 
For I want you to know how great a struggle I have for you, for those who are in Laodicea, and for all those who have not seen me face to face, that their hearts may be encouraged, being knitted together in love, to reach all the riches and the fullness of understanding, the knowledge of God's mystery, which is Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdoms and knowledge. I say this in order that no one delude you with plausible arguments, for I am absent in the body, yet I am with you in the spirit, rejoicing to see your good order and firmness of your faith in Christ. You know, when I'm preparing a message, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm saying, God, I don't want it to be me. You've got to show me it's you. And when I sat there this morning, God was preparing my heart, not just my mind, preparing my heart. And I read that several times, and I'm going, yes, yes. The mysteries, the secrets, the hidden things are in Christ, and Christ is in me. Whatever you're going through, whatever is happening in your life, I want you to tell you something. God has it. The scripture says, if he knocks and you open the door, you'll read the scripture that you need for today. And God will speak through it and it will and nothing anybody else can say to you than what God will say to you. And it will make sense to you. And it means something to you. But you know, he's knocking. And you've got to open it up. You've got to open it up. This, what I'm about to say here, is something that God showed me as well. This is a summary. The church, that's the people, has Christians to deliver grand cash from the curse of the past, the present, and the future. God has shown me that there is an open door for us because we did not close his door of the church in the last few years. I want to thank you for listening to me. But if you've been listening to God today and you want the anointing oil to break the bondage in your life, I'm asking you to come. I'm asking Pastor John to, and uh, the elders, wherever the oil is, because it's the oil that breaks the bondage. It's only a symbol. But you just remember something. The Holy Spirit is crying out. Crying out. To lead and to guide us into all truth. So I don't know if you have a piece of background music or something. But I want you to come. I want you to be anointed with oil. Jesus shed blood has cleansed the soil in the church. And if we honor and respect that just coming out of Easter...